Isolation is growing in men. Millennials continue to move back home with their parents. Social media addicts. Feelings of angst and insecurity. We're talking about incels. The incels. Are the incels. Debilitated by debt, starved for sex, working a soul-crushingly tedious job. This isn't just incels. There are many, many lost, lonely men in this country, and our culture only has bad solutions for them. Maybe just numb yourself with digital delights, or dissolve into some totalizing political ideology, or just sit there and suffer, because you deserve it. There is another option, and it's found in the surprising life of Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah, that Grant. Not the 2D titan of the $50 bill. He was once a short, skinny, permanently hunched cast-off, begging for work. Yet somehow, in just a couple years, he goes from that to this, commanding a million men and becoming president. Underneath this, the most ordinary of packaging lie timeless principles of self-mastery, lessons for escaping a doomed destiny. They saved Grant, they saved the country, and maybe they can save you too. Seven years before the Civil War, Grant is just washed out of the army for treating his lonely boredom with the uh, standard self-care regimen of the time, drinking himself into oblivion. When I have nothing to do, I get blue and depressed and I have a natural craving for drink. He slinks back to the Midwest, tries to carve out a simple civilian life for himself, tries to be a farmer, fails, tries to run for elected office, and fails. He starts a real estate company. He makes the financially suboptimal decision to not collect rents and fails. This is the real flesh and blood Ulysses, dead-eyed, forced to sell firewood on the streets, Eventually, he takes a job as a junior staffer at his father's leather goods store. His younger brothers are his bosses. Grant seems destined to dissolve into history like countless other lost, lonely men. 1861, war breaks out. Grant, desperate to redeem himself, tries to enlist. He has to wander around the Union offices for hours on end until he's finally issued a small command out west. April 6, 1862, a small peninsula in Tennessee. Grant's forces are ambushed by an enormous Confederate assault. You know, at Shiloh, uh, the United States suffered more combat casualties than all our previous wars combined, which includes the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and the Mexican-American War. The Battle of Shiloh dispelled the delusions of the Union, that they could just like slap a little bit of sense into the Confederacy. After the first day of the Battle of Shiloh, the first thing Grant would have heard were the screams of people being operated on. Officers running around trying to collect their folks and put them back into, you know, proper formations. Grant removes himself from that and sits down. That's right. The night after that epic carnage, our boy sits down under a tree, all alone. In this moment, we're witnessing the first principle essential to Grant's ascension. He seeks stillness amidst the storm. Everyone around him is letting their behavior be dictated by primal fear. But Ulysses resists reality's attempts to hijack his mind. And this seems to have, have focused Grant's mind. He had this ability to see what mattered. And what piece of information matters the most in that moment? Reports of the enemy showed that their condition at the end of the first day was deplorable. The enemy's exhausted. Wonder what we could do with that information. His good friend uh, comes up and, you know, says, you know, we've had the, the devil's own day. And Grant looks at him, calm, and says, lick him tomorrow, though. Day two, Grant goes on the offensive. 
exploiting the enemy's exhaustion and flipping defeat into victory. Stillness gave him the chance to see the thing that everyone else is too busy reacting to notice. After Shiloh, Grant sets his sights on Vicksburg, an enormous fort on the bank of the Mississippi River, serving as the central joint of the Confederate supply lines out west. All the enemy supplies would come by that point. I looked upon side movements as a waste of time and material. Grant sets siege. He fights in the woods. Nothing's working. It's in this moment that Grant finds the freedom in failure. He'd been in a dark place before. He had been humiliated working for his brother, selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis, had hocked his, his, uh, his gold watch uh, in the interwar period to buy Christmas presents for his family. Failure, humiliation, poverty. It's the prospect of suffering these things that keep people from being bold. Grant's already suffered them. He'd already been to the bottom of the abyss. He'd survived the worst the world can do to a person. The prospect of failure didn't faze him anymore. He's free to try something everyone else thinks is insane. Grant proposes marching south, crossing the Mississippi into enemy territory, and attacking the fort's exposed underbelly. He needs ships to cross the river, though. And to get them, he'll need to run right past the Vicksburg gun batteries. And that's supposed to be suicide. I mean, Grant's really challenging an accepted norm before the war. It was almost an article of faith that uh, fortifications versus ships meant that the ship sank and the fortifications won. Grant's crew hems close to the shoreline, using the fast Mississippi current as an accelerant. He only loses a single ship. I was now in the enemy's country. There was nothing to be done but to go forward to decisive victory. Vicksburg Falls. The citadel of Vicksburg on the Mississippi was a place the Confederacy had staked their nationhood. And in essence, they say, thou shalt not pass. Uh, and he does pass. Grant turned failure into a tool of self-liberation. Grant's Vicksburg victory gets him promoted to the head of the whole Union Army. He's called to the East, and Lincoln tasks him with accomplishing the one thing all of his predecessors had failed to do, to go south and tame a mythic beast. Robert E. Lee. His dad is a Revolutionary War hero. His wife is the great-granddaughter of George Washington. At the start of the war, while Grant was begging for work, Lee was turning down an offer to head the whole Union Army, instead joining the Confederacy to fight on behalf of his home state of Virginia. Over the last four years, Lee has become a legend, the invincible gentleman genius, compensating for having much fewer men by launching unorthodox, high-risk attacks. As Grant's army heads down to the Confederate capital, Lee, with a much smaller army, actually comes up to attack him. Right here, in the dense forest known as the Wilderness. This neutralizes the Union's advantages. Grant can't use artillery. Lee can hide his true numbers. And the furious rain of bullets ignites dry brush and pine needles, sparking a raging inferno. Wounded Union men are roasted alive. Lee had pulled these tricks on Grant's predecessors, and every one had fallen back to Washington in fear. The Stoics had this practice of imagining great men in their most primal and humiliating moments. Think of like Alexander the Great with explosive diarrhea, or Barack Obama uncontrollably sneezing. This exercise was meant to strip away the legend that encrusts them. 
to remind themselves not to make gods of men. And our boy Ulysses doesn't make gods of men. I had known Lee and knew he was mortal. After this horror show, Grant's men are obsessively worried about Lee. Grant stops them. Let us not be concerned with what General Lee is going to do to us. Let us be concerned with what we are going to do to General Lee. Grant stares into this industrial strength cauldron of human misery, engineered by the invincible gentleman genius. And he says the words all his predecessors were too shook to say. I shall take no backward step. He's the first Union commander to not turn tail. Do not be intimidated into paralysis by the accomplishments of others. Remember, they bleed too. Look at this musky log cabin. It's got the size and smell of your one weird uncle's tool shed. And it is glorious. At this moment in history, Grant's in charge of a million men. He's the second most famous man in America after Lincoln. And that is where he sets up shop. There's an enormous colonial mansion literally a hundred feet away, and he doesn't want it. Now compare that to Grant's predecessor. George McClellan, the previous commander of the Union Army, was bursting with ego. In contrast to Grant, uh, McClellan has lived a life of unbridled success. 13 is at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, rises just prior to the war to being president of a successful railroad concern. When he's handed the reins of the entire Union Army, McClellan is four years younger than me. McClellan was the embodiment of this saying from the old Stoic philosopher Seneca that a great destiny is a great slavery. McClellan was enslaved to a fantasy about his own military genius. You have no idea how the men brighten up now when I go among them. I believe they love me. God has placed a great work in my hands. A fantasy he worked very, very hard to protect. He's famed for being uh, incredibly cautious. Uh, frankly, if you've, uh, you're, you're the self-named young Napoleon, uh, you've got something to lose. At Antietam, he insisted the Confederate Army was three times bigger than it actually was. I am here in a terrible place. The enemy have from three to four times my force. And refused to attack. But Grant has killed the ego. He has no fantasy to protect, no lofty vision that he has to live up to. He's free to act and adapt. When General Lee keeps blocking Grant's attempts to get to Richmond, it becomes obvious the original plan is not gonna work. Without a greater sacrifice of human life than I am willing to make, taking Richmond cannot be accomplished. So we can't get to Richmond. There's gotta be another way. So where does Richmond get its food from? He tracks the supply line 20 miles south to Petersburg. Grant sneaks away from Lee's army, surrounds Petersburg, traps Lee, then steadily snips his rail lines. The siege of Petersburg lasts 10 months. By the end, Union soldiers are consuming five times more calories per day than the Confederates. Grant had originally envisioned a battlefield victory, right? An epic, clean vanquishing of the enemy. Instead, he saves the Union via starvation. The culture would have you believe that ego is power. It's not. It's enslavement. Ego will have you sit still rather than act and risk damaging the grand story you're telling yourself about yourself. Lee eventually abandons Petersburg. Grant chases him down, preventing him from linking up with Confederate forces further south and squeezing his troops until Lee finally agrees to surrender here. Appomattox. 
The two titans sit down right in there. Grant asks his aide to hand over the term sheets of surrender. The aide walks over, holds out the sheet of paper. Lee looks up, and he is stunned by who he sees. Ely Parker, a full-blooded Seneca Indian. Born on a New York reservation, Ely met Grant during his loser years in Illinois. At the outbreak of the war, Ely tries to enlist in the Union Army, but is told that this is a white man's war. When no one's watching and when no one cared, Grant defies the prevailing prejudice of his time, hires Ely to be his private secretary. The Greek philosopher Epictetus tells us that if you're ever tempted to look for outside approval, realize that you have compromised your integrity. If you need a witness, be your own. I know way too much of my own life is spent signaling my tribal affiliations on the internet. I get moral self-satisfaction from that, as if that were an acceptable substitute for doing real good for real people. We need to practice virtue when no one is watching. Grant jots down three pages of terms. Ely transcribes them on official letterhead. He hands it to Lee, who, after a stunned silence, finally says, I'm glad to see one real American here. Ely replies, we are all real Americans. If you did that when no one was watching, the big decision as president had to have been a little bit easier for him. Once in the White House, Grant defies members of his own cabinet to establish military occupation of South Carolina to crush the KKK. And he powers through the constitutional amendment that would serve as the legal backbone for the civil rights movement. The Civil War could have turned out differently than it did. We've seen that there were other Union generals who weren't, <laughs> weren't quite up to the task of getting the job done. What school teaches you about that war is scandalously incomplete. It's like, no, 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 it wasn't just more men or better artillery or a bigger economy that won the war for the North. It was this. Grant's particular philosophical technology, the way he processed adversity. The application of that technology is an essential reason why that's a museum and not the seat of a new nation. Seek stillness amidst the storm. Find the freedom in failure. Do not make gods of men. Kill the ego. Practice virtue when no one is watching. Grant used these tools to go from deadbeat to a hero of American history. So how will you use them?